Today is the first of a series of uh, talks we're going to have uh, over the coming weeks. And uh, we've got some very exciting, inspirational people that we're going to be meeting over the next few weeks. Um, before I say any more about that, uh, I think the best thing is we, we can start with uh, prayer. And for the prayer, we've got one of our SDP students, Rupali. So Rupali, could you please do the noka? Namu arhantaram namu 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 sidharam namu 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 ayariyaram namu 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 vichayaram namu 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 loye sabasahuram Eso panchanamo karo Sava pava parasaro Mangalarancha sarvesim Padamam have mangalam Padamam have mangalam Thank you, Rupali. That was beautiful. So uh, today we are going to have the first of a few sessions called A Conversation With. And today we've got a, a very special guest, which Rajiv in a minute will introduce. And what I'd like to just say is, so today is going to be a conversation where we can all sit back, listen to uh, the stories and experiences of these uh, wonderful individuals. And if you've got any particular burning questions that come up, please share them or put them on the chat and we'll try and make sure that we can put those questions to our guest. Um, so can I ask Rajiv uh, to uh, hand over to you to just introduce our guest today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pramit. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Wenda Shehata to join us today. Wenda and her partner, Matthew, founded the Huglets Wood Farm Vegan Animal Sanctuary in 1995. It is believed to be the only kind in the whole of Europe founded on the Jain principles of Ahimsa and Aparigra. The farm offers lifelong protection to over 300 cows and farmed animals who have suffered at the hands of inconsiderate humans. They offer pain-free, loving, uh, palliative care to all the residents with no recourse to e euthanasia. Wenda lives a simple life in harmony with nature. So let's have a conversation with Wenda to find out more about her life, her motivation, and her journey to create this Huglets uh, Wood Farm. Wenda, um, again, uh, um, heartiest well, welcome, uh, and thank you very much for making the time to join us today. Um, thank you. <laughs> yep, thank you, Wenda. Um, so most likely, Wenda, before we get into how you started off the Huglets uh, Wood Farm, it's gonna be quite interesting to find out that most probably you were born in a non-vegetarian family. And were there any childhood impressions that led you to being a vegetarian? And first, I suppose, and later a vegan. So it would be just nice to know a little bit more about your childhood and what led you to become who you are right now. Of course. Um, I was born, as most uh, Westerners are, into a family that uh, was a meat-eating family. Um, in, in addition to this, my father was a hunter. He, he thought it was a great pastime to go out with a gun with, with other people and to shoot animals. At a very, very young age, I used to open the door to something that was called the game room, where the housekeeper and the gardener would hang the game that he had shot. And I, I don't know why, but I just found it an entrancing place. It was full of horror. And, and I just couldn't understand what would make people do this. By the time I was three, just after my third birthday, I made the connection that the lamb on my plate was the same as the lamb in the fields. I realized that beef was cow. I realized that chicken was chicken. And so at about three and a half, I, I made a decision that there was no way that I was eating that. I didn't, I, obviously I didn't know, uh, but I just felt that it was intrinsically wrong to, to take life and to eat it. And 
what I did was I, I became vegetarian. I didn't know the term vegetarian, but, but I made the stance that I wouldn't eat the flesh that, that my parents were putting in front of me or the housekeeper was putting on my plate. And um, my father would make me sit at the table on, on a Sunday afternoon in particular because the family had a, a roast lunch. And he used to say to me, you will stay there, you will remain there until you've eaten the meat. And the housekeeper would pop in and out and she would try and take pieces of flesh from my plate. And I would say to her, don't do it because he'll think he's one. And so for, I, I would think possibly six to 12 months, um, wherever we were in the world, because my father was a diplomat, so we traveled. Um, but, but we had this every week, we had the same thing. In the end, my father decided it was just a phase I was going through and I would grow out of it. He had left his body by the time I became vegan. <laughs> but, um, he, he had to accept as I grew up that I hadn't changed, that I, 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 I was just very, very strange to be in the family that he had. Um, but I, I really didn't care. I didn't want to be a part and I didn't know why. I just felt that it was very, very wrong to, to take life and to eat the bodies of whatever it been killed. That's amazing, Wenda. At a very young age, uh, three and a half, and to be quite assertive, uh, that indeed is, it seems to be very admirable. Uh, you know, how, how can a three-year-old child, uh, you know, have such a, something must have moved you uh, very, very <laughs> intensely. I, I think it was possibly, I, I believe in previous lives. And, and I'm sure that it was, was something for the previous incarnation that obviously followed me into this and, and allowed me to make that decision that, that at such a young age, I would know there was something wrong. Um, and, and it didn't really stop there, actually thinking about it now. I, I used to, to bring home damaged animals wherever we were in the world. I would, would bring home damaged animals and nurse them back to, to health. So, so that, that was before we had the century. So I think that was my, my learning period um, of, of s sort of looking at what I was going to do later on in life after I'd led a normal life to placate my family and everyone around. That's wonderful, Wenda. I think that leads us to the, in fact, quite interesting that uh, it'd be nice to know how, what led you to actually start the animal sanctuary, uh, you know, uh, what was your journey to actually think that I really want to do that? Do this. Okay. Well, when I was when I was about seven, we came back to England. I we were in the Middle East. We spent a lot of time in the Middle East. So so I caused a lot of problems over there by my my attitude to um, slaughter uh, at times like aid um, and um, the mullah and religious people around used to shout at my parents and tell them to keep me locked in the house because. I would take the sheep and the goats from outside the mosque. I would be about nine or 10 years old then. And <laughs> my parents used to have to keep a, keep a, a calendar of religious, religious times for, for um, Muslims. And, and they would keep me in the house. But we came back when I was about, I, I guess about seven, maybe, maybe eight. And my uncle had died and he was a dairy farmer. And my father came home to sell the farm because nobody else wanted to carry it on. And we spent quite a few months at the farm, during which time some calves were born. And I heard my, pet, my father talking to the herdsman to say that the calves would be sent to market um, the following day. So I decided that they wouldn't go to market and that I would, I would liberate them. I would take them away and they'd be safe as a very young child does. So I, I took um, a bucket of milk from the milking parlor and took these calves up. It was late afternoon, early evening. And I took them up to a copse behind the farm and we stayed up there all night. The calves had the milk. I, I hid with them in bushes and I didn't realize that while my, my parents and all the village were calling for me, that there would come a time in the morning that the calves would want more milk. So they were out all night calling for me and we stayed very quiet and rested. 
And then at about 5 36 o'clock in the morning, the calves started to call for milk, which led the search party to find me. My punishment for this was to be made to stand and watch the calves load for market the next morning. And as a tiny child, I vowed to myself, I didn't know how and I didn't know when, but, but one day I would be able to have a place where no one separated from their, their family, where no one was sent off to die, where everybody lived as long as they were meant to live, as long as their bodies permitted them to live. And, and as a child, I thought it would be paradise. So I had to wait an awfully long time. It was a dream that, that stayed with me all my life. I didn't know how I would do it. I didn't know when I would do it, especially when I married and had a child. And then I had a career. And I just trusted that everything would fall into place. So when I was uh, 30, one, I was in a position, I had my son very young, and he had gone through through um, learning everything. He'd started his own business when he was 16, which was a heartbreak to me. But as my uncle said, let him do it because he can go to university when he's older. So I, I went with that. But um, he then decided that that he was was going to run the company and that he would stay at home. And he did until he met the woman that he married. And unlike most sensible parents, I was absolutely jubilant because he, he had met somebody that he loved. He seemed happy. And to me, it was the time of my life that I could actually start a sanctuary. So at that time, I didn't know Matthew. Um, we had we had met during our protest of live exports. We'd spoken on the phone. Um, we'd met in passing, as I said, and and so I thought I had made an, an agreement to myself that as soon as I was able, I was going to to renounce whatever I could. Maya was going to my my life. I was going to live very simply. And I was going to serve cows, uh, cows in particular, and any other animal that, that needed help. And I did that. I rented a small piece of land. The first cows came to me. Um, that was very early 1995. And suddenly Matthew started to come to help. And he was coming more frequently to help. We were making decisions that, that normal people wouldn't have to make together. And, and as one thing led to another, we decided we would spend our lives together. Um, we had a different, a different form of marriage because we, we wanted to make sure that we were together to serve the animals and the environment and to live simply. So that was part of our vows, <laughs> that we would dedicate our lives to caring for, for animals that were eaten to educate as many people as we possibly could about the horrors of the meat industry and to to explain as gently as possible to to vegetarians that there is no such thing as kind dairy anymore so that was was nearly 27 years ago um now i'm just over 60 and and i'm hoping and praying that i can have another 30 years in this body Wonderful, Wenda. That's really, really admirable. Uh, just amazing, like a conviction, a calling, and you can see things just fall into place. Just amazing. What a journey uh, uh, that has been. Uh, uh, but truly, truly admirable. Um, would it be possible to describe uh, what would be a typical day at your at the farm? Like, wh how would you spend your time? Okay. But without wanting to be funny, there is no typical day. We set out to have a normal day where we can get up before sunrise. If we have calves here, then we make milk substitute for them. We feed them. We then feed all the other animals. The cows will have hay unless they're out in the field. If they're out in the field, we go out and and we spend time with them. We, we use that time to just check them over. We walk amongst them. We look at them, we touch them, we feel them. It's To us, it's nicer than bringing them in and putting them through a contraption that holds them against their will. 
while you check every bit of them, especially when they get older. So we have a very close relationship with the cows, which enables us to, to check them very, very gently. So um, we tend to, I, I remember when I was young and, and my father, for all his, his strangeness to me, he was an adorable man, a very good man, but obviously he was a meat eater, a hunter, a shooter, a fisher. And he, he alone, though, is responsible for taking me to India when I was tiny. Um, it, was, it was the only place at that time that I could eat anything that anybody gave me because it was always veg, always vegetarian. Now things are different, but that's another story. But I, I remember once my father was reading to me and he said, uh, a pious woman always feeds chapati to cow before she takes her own food. And that from a tiny age has always stayed with me. So we don't take food until everyone here has been fed. That's the birds, the cows, the sheep, the pigs, whatever is here, um, the cats, even the cats. So, so we tend to take food maybe nine o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning, by which time everybody has been fed. Then we start to muck out. Um, sometimes we have an emergency call and somebody will phone and say, my husband's taking a calf to the slaughterhouse, can you help? Um, in which case we jump in the car and drive off and see what's happening and try and negotiate the freedom of, of the calf or the old cow sometimes. When a cow gets to the point that she, she is no longer useful, then the, the farmers will kill them. But if it's a normal day, we muck out, we clean everything, then we do medicine. Um, so if anyone's having injections or anyone needs medicine or anyone needs specific care, um, we do that then. And then by that time, we're at lunchtime milk feed for the calves. And in the afternoon, we go out to the second herd of cows and we do the same as the first in the morning. So we check them over, we spend time with them. We see that everybody's well. And if, if we don't have anybody who's inside needing care in the barn, so that means they're preparing to leave their body, um, then we get on with work. We'll do vegetables or we will work the land or Matthew will go and check the woodland and look after the trees there. Um, if somebody is, I, you mentioned earlier that we, we don't euthanize. We believe that everybody is in their body for a certain period of time and it's not for us to shorten that period of time but to work with whoever, maybe a cow or a sheep, to make sure that, that they pass at the time they're meant to. I've always felt that if we, if we euthanize in the name of mercy killing, that that is murder. Uh, in the West, obviously, we all know, people have a serious problem dealing with physical death. And, and there's a lot of pressure on us to make sure that nobody can ever claim that somebody has suffered. And in almost 27 years, we've never had an uncomfortable transition, never. We tend to spend time with them. I, I will move into the barn with whoever is preparing to leave their body. I will sleep with them. I will give them water, feed. They, we let them lead us. They, they show us because we know them and understand them well what they want. They, they tell us when they no longer want bread, uh, water or they don't want food, they will actually demonstrate that they don't want this. When they're leading up to the point of transition, we will offer them massage because if they're in one position for a long time, it's discom uh, uncomfortable. We will turn them. Matthew and I can turn a thousand kilo bullock on our own so that, that the pressure is relieved from one side to another. We learned this when we were much younger and, and although we're, we're, we're quite mature now, we can still do it. Um, afternoons are times when we do everything we have to do. And in the evenings, it starts again, the coffee and then more hay into the cows or the sheep. Um, the pigs will sometimes come out for a walk in the afternoon. We'll walk them around the woodland so they can snuffle without harming the, the trees. We keep them to the path. And <clears throat> the birds will be put away at dusk. They normally put themselves away. 
and by about um, we tend to eat before dusk we we try not to eat in the dark why I don't know I it turns out that it, it is a, a, a Jane Tennant which we we have followed without knowing what it is we just feel it's better that we don't eat when it's dark um, so that gives us the whole of the evening to do other things the day will end with bedtime milk for the calves at about midnight and and then we will take five five hours sleep four or five hours sleep and unless something untoward happens such as uh, we need to go and collect somebody who's going to lose their lives then that is roughly a normal day for us no, I, mean, no, I think none of us in the city life could actually claim to have, uh, uh, you know, can even visualize or think what a diverse and interesting lifestyle, uh, Venda, that's just truly admirable. Uh, Venda, you mentioned that um, your dad took you to India when you were quite young. Um, the concept of mm -hmm. uh, sanctuary, in a way, it's been quite prevalent in India, as you know, the Panjra poles. Is that something which came to your uh, uh, ideas? Like, is, was that sort of, have you visited many Panjra poles and... Is that something which led you to create this animal vegan sanctuary? I think my father made it an annual an annual trip, um, maybe to see me peaceful because I was a, a difficult child. I felt things very much, and and I, I think he found raising me very difficult. And the only time I was normal was India, and and he would take me to Goshalas. He would take me to Panjrapul. He would take me. Um, to villages where they lived simply uh, with animals. And I think possibly it might be that, that having seen all this and absorbed all this when I was young, that it has given me the idea of how we live now. I mean, Matthew grew up in Africa, so he lived in a, a similar situation, although his parents were, were uh, representatives of the government. Um, he, as a child, would disappear into the bush while I was, I was wandering off into cow sheds and, and different things. So, so the two of us have probably picked up an awful lot from our youth, and we're putting it into practice now. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but there was something so wonderful about India, because I was going really before the changes started happening. Um, probably before lots of you were even born, <laughs> but um, it was a time where if a cow walked into the street, all the traffic stopped. And, and to me, that was the most wonderful thing, that there was great respect for, for cows. Whereas now when I go, because I, I still go every year, um, I, I still do savor there i will will sit with the the cows who are preparing for transition and i will chant to them i will feed them i'll water them because sadly it's something that people don't want to do they don't mind working the oxen they don't mind feeding the cows that give milk they don't mind milking the cows but at the end of their lives they don't seem to have the desire to serve so so i'm always put to work doing those things so I guess because I do things like that in India, I come back and quite happily do them here. And, and I've done these for many, many years. So, so yes, I, I, guess, I guess having grown up with these ideas, that that's the reason why, why we have the sanctuary today. Excellent. Wendell, you did mention that you know, you're quite a strong-minded uh, personality. And especially when it comes to uh, animals, you know, you would actually voice it. Do you consider yourself as an activist? And sort of leading to generally people, when they look at Extinction Rebellion, people think that, you know, they, they've got a good cause in mind, but sometimes they, they, the means could be quite extreme. Um, so do you, and you seem to be very sort of very kind heart towards the animals. So how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as an, uh, as an activist and you'd be going at any lengths to protect the rights of animals? Mm, that's that's a really good question because I'm I suppose the rajasic side of me would say I have to be active I have to speak out I have to take animals who are going to lose their lives when I was younger yes I was very headstrong um, I would would I, I remember once 
being at the airport when I was probably early 20s and I was so incensed. I was traveling to India and I was so incensed because I was taking a snack. I think the flight had been delayed and a Hindu family at the side of me were eating bacon <laughs> and I was deranged. And, and I had to say very politely to them, you know, forgive me for, for mentioning this, but why are you eating pig? Why, why do you think it's right? And we had a very nice conversation. I wasn't angry about it. I have no right to be angry. And, and I guess whilst I, 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 I protested, I, I lived three months on the seafront in Hove protesting live exports where they were taking calves abroad for slaughter and sheep as well. And I was very angry. I was arrested so many times that, that my son actually, who was having to come and collect me from the police station, um, said to me, this has to end. You can't behave like this. You're, you're meant to be setting me an example. And, and he gave the most dreadful interview to Radio 4 uh, about what it was like to live with a mother who was an animal rights activist. And I, I listened to it and, and made some serious changes in my life because I realized that I'm not, I, I'm not just me, I was a mother. And, and every child needs their parents to behave in a way that is respectful. So that was, that was a big lesson to me. And, and I thought there has to be a way of, of not failing the animals and not failing the environment, not failing trees. It's not just animals, it's all life forms that really should be nurtured and respected and cared for. And, and that's from single sense beings right up to five cents. You know, we, we are in a position where we have great responsibility and it's fine for some people just to go through life and have a very comfortable time and, and to have everything they want in a materialistic way. But there has to come a point for us to, to, to continue our own development and to, to, to become more than just human form. And, and to do that, I really do believe that we, we have to speak out in a nice, respectful way. We have to live by example. We have to, to do things that cause no harm. So, so I am an activist still, but I go about it in a different way. We, we educate people, we talk to people. We, we, as I said before, live by example. We tend to converse with people rather than shout at them. And, and I think that works well. I, I have worries about, and I don't want to criticize Extinction Rebellion, I don't want to criticize the people that are uh, stopping the traffic on the M25. It's where they're at. It's, it's drawing attention. If our society was fairer, people wouldn't feel that they had to um, take to the streets, that they had to cause disruption to other people who really have no part, play no part in, in what they're protesting against. But I, I still feel anger and I still feel hurt when I see lorries full of animals going to the slaughterhouse. I don't understand what right we have as a species to take other life. I guess I go about it differently. Now I'm grown up, I can't, I can't really scream and shout as I would have done when I was in my teens or my twenties. My, my parents were always extremely ashamed of me. My father fortunately had left his body by the time I got to the point that I was, was very vocal in how I felt about things. But my poor mother uh, virtually disowned me. She would, would hold up the daughters of her friends who had made wonderful marriages and who were quite content to, to run a home, have a career, have children, but I was different. Amazing, a, a very unique story. And uh, uh, earlier on, you mentioned <clears throat> that you believe in reincarnation. Um, is there any particular faith or philosophy you, you strongly believe in, uh, which, which kind of is shaping your life and how you treat animals? I, 
Well, I'm I'm an initiated Krishna devotee. Uh, my spiritual name is Bhumi Priya Devidasi. I I found out many well, we found out many years ago when when we had a visit from a, a Jain friend <clears throat> that we were more Jain than he. And I I think subconsciously we follow Jain ten very, very easily, without even considering it. It comes naturally to us. Um, I, I believe probably from my time in India, my father would, would occasionally uh, leave me with sadhus. <laughs> and, and of course, we couldn't talk to each other. But, but I think maybe some of their energy rubbed off on me. And, and I, would, I spent a lot of time um, with, with people who had a very deep philosophy when I was, was in my late teens, early 20s. And I, I learned a lot from them. And, and without question, I, I do believe that, that we reincarnate as many times as we need to. Um, and I think, I think to attain moksha, we have to do that. I, I would have liked more time to spend discovering the spirituality of life. But I tend to to grab hold of of whatever I can read and and work with the animals at the same time. I do believe that all souls are equal, um, and I I fully accept the the single sense beings up to five sense beings, and and I do accept that probably if we're going to harm something, it's less harmful to do it to a single sense or two sense being, but I, I lean, I guess, if people say what you follow, I would lean more to Jainism. To me, it's the most natural way of life. And, and I, I really think people who are born into a Jain society, into a to Jain family are so blessed. I think with it comes a huge responsibility to live a good life. I think it's very, very important that that people like Matthew and people like me um, learn from you all. It's it's there is just so much that makes perfect sense. So, Krishna devotee, yes, but our daily lives are Jane. Wonderful. I think, Wenda, I think we need to learn a lot about you. We could be Jains by name, but I think on the contrary, there's so much to <laughs> learn and leave, uh, learn from, from yourself. Um, Wenda, uh, I, I guess we all are constrained by the resources and by either could be financial or could be space. Um, have you came across any situation whereby you had to turn away animals or you just could not do enough for everyone? And do you have any regrets uh, that, you know, you could not sort of help... Uh, the animals you so dearly love. Mm. We, as strange as it might sound, in 27 years, we've never had to turn anyone away. That said, I have refused to take unwanted pet calves, unwanted pet pigs, unwanted pet lambs who've grown into sheep because I think people have to take responsibility for their actions. And sometimes we get calls from people who will say, you have to help me. Um, my pig has outgrown the house. Well, my response is, why have you got a pig in the house? Uh, why would you take a little piglet full knowing that, that nature dictates it's going to grow into a huge pig, 300, 400 kilos? Why would you do that? Because it's nice to have a little piglet running around. So right, you take the responsibility for it now. This is your duty to that life. You have to find a way of maintaining him or her. And likewise, people who want a little calf um, and they take it because they can keep it close to them for a while. And then it grows into an adolescent bullock or, or heifer. And they're like children. They're naughty. They will play games with humans. And, and it's very much a case of being a sensible, for want of a better word, parent or guardian. 
one has to tolerate the growth, the emotional growth, the psychological growth, the physical growth of any being that you care for. And, and with it comes the, the problems, like we call it terrible twos. As soon as a heifer or a bullock hits two, they're disrespectful, they're naughty, sometimes they're violent, but we just have to continue to care for them. But people in houses don't know this and they can't care for it. I would, I would love to see legislation brought in to stop people having farm animals as pets. Let them have dogs and cats and mice and guinea pigs and rats and whatever they want. They're small, they're manageable. But when one gets something that is not known well, then that is the time I, I sit for ages explaining to people that they have a duty of care. They can't just push them aside because they've got to a point where, where they're not manageable anymore. They have to learn, they have to grow together. They have to be responsible in the, in the, the wet autumn mornings and the snowy winters. And, and that is really the only time that we've refused to take animals. But with that refusal comes a lot of help, a lot of knowledge. We'll talk, we'll help them, we'll advise them. And in many cases, people will find a way of continuing and caring well for them. We've, we've not so far, and I, I really, I'm not superstitious, but I, I don't like to say. So I will say so far we've never had to turn anyone away and i think i think if one believes that everything is as it should be and this sounds very profound and i don't want it to sound profound because then it's, it's not practical it's not sensible but i trust i trust that there will never be a time that we can't take any more animals so as one leaves their body another one comes it's almost like a continuing circle of life and transition, physical death. And, and so far in 27 years, it's worked. Um, even to the point that last year we were able to take 21 cows from Ireland. To, to me, how, how on earth can it be possible? But we found somewhere to put them. Sadly, the consequences weren't so good for one of them, but we were able to bring them home and they're here now and we're with a lot of people's help able to bring able to build a barn for them for winter um we've just we were contacted a few days ago about uh four beautiful um two bullocks two cows who were in need of home because their farmer uh could no longer kill he stopped killing five years ago but he's 83 years old now and he can't look after them anymore. He's literally two miles down the road. So however it's happened, however it's come together, we've made an arrangement that through winter, Matthew and I will go and feed them and muck them out and give them fresh straw and water. Um, so he doesn't have to do it. He doesn't have to worry that he's not physically able to do it. And then in springtime, they will come here. So everything, I think if it's meant to be, we find a way or a way is found it's not us we're not wonderful people it just it's it's the greater good whatever how it's meant to be it happens um i would hate i i don't know what i would do if i um if i ever had to say no because that would be we would be we would be involved in murder and and i i wouldn't want that not because it would affect me i will take whatever karma comes my way that's that's fine but for that life that would be shortened that would have to probably be lived again i would i would be very very sad so i will continue to trust that all will be well uh we will work flat out we won't sit back and just and just say oh everything will be fine we work to make it fine and and we won't stop doing that so hopefully we will never have to say no to anyone who needs sanctuary. Wonderful, Wenda. That's, yeah, I really hope so. Uh, Wenda, have you come across any dile dilemmas in life? So for example, many con uh, conventional medicine is actually tested on animals. So, you know, if at all you were to take some kind of medicine which was tested on animals, or perhaps even that the animals which you are looking after or treating 
might need to use uh, some medicine which has been treated on on, on animals. Um, how, how do you uh, cope with that uh, kind of the, the ideology of using medicine? Okay, from the time that I discovered that medicine is tested on animals, I do not use conventional allopathic medicine. Um, we had a dilemma recently because um, just around Christmas, we both got COVID and we treated ourselves. We thought, go for it, <laughs> we'll just rest as much as we can, take lots of fluids. Um, mine turned into long COVID and, and I, I suffered nerve damage in my legs. So as a consequence, I was falling over in, in supermarkets and public places because my leg would just give way without warning. I found it incredibly embarrassing because I'm of an age where people would rush over and help me and, and get me to my feet. But um, we, we were asked if we would take the COVID vaccination and I really had to investigate. Well, we both investigated and we found out that the COVID vaccine has no animal components in it whatsoever. Um, so that was sort of acceptable, but the testing they, they actually tested the COVID vaccines on the blood of water fleas. And as insignificant as that sounds, there are lots of little lives. And we huffed and puffed and said in lots and lots of adult years, we hadn't taken anything or done anything that would be as a result of, of animal suffering. But looking at it, uh, and especially as I was so dreadfully ill with COVID, um, we decided that we would take the karma that goes with, with using medicine that's taken so many lives for testing and we would have the vaccinations and we were both double vaccinated. When it comes to the animals, um, I tend to think they are animals and therefore if they need medicine that has taken the lives of other animals, then that is for them. It is not for us. It's not to keep us going or to make us better. We tend to, to use lots of different treatments for the animals. They tend to remain very healthy. And, and it's normally at the very end of their lives, <clears throat> do excuse me, at the end of their lives that, that they might need pain relief. Um, if they get arthritis or something like that. But we normally go um, along the homeopathic route, although homeopathic isn't necessarily um, vegan because some of the, the remedies have got a gazillionth part of, of some snake or something in. Um, but we're selective. We, we tend to look at, at different things. Um, feeding, um, so nutritional things are very, very good for the animals. And we can sometimes get over problems by changing nutrition or by adding minerals and vitamins. Um, if, if the animals need something, then I feel for their benefit, I, I think they are, they are not responsible for being given medicine. So I like to believe that doesn't cause any karmic reaction. Um, I, I think that I think that it's it's really our judgment that is in question when it comes to giving them medicine. But we tend to do it for their benefit because how could we leave them in pain? Whereas ourselves, we can deal with pain, we can deal with different things, we can make that choice. So we have to make the choice for them and we do it. But as I said, it's it's not common that we use allopathic medicine. But if we have to, for the benefit of the animals, we will do. Wenda, um, you know, Wenda. we're all living in the 21st century and we're all used to the modern comforts of life. I understand that you lead a kind of a sustainable <laughs> lifestyle. Would you be able to describe how do you manage to live a very minimalistic lifestyle? We have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the long and short of it. We um, we use solar power uh, 
we have no electricity here. We have um, solar power and a very small wind turbine, which we checked does no harm to birds. We have never in all these years have had a bird caught in the wind turbine. Uh, we're very selective about, about what we have here. We have no television. We have a wind-up radio. Uh, we also have a battery radio. We obviously have a laptop. <laughs> and no washing machine, no freezer. Um, we've just given in and got a fridge because we've had to have one for open days. We tend to cook what we need for one meal. We don't store. We, we live on what we produce here um, and go out to the shop to buy things like rice, flour, uh, tea and coffee which we probably shouldn't have <laughs> but we do soy milk we have to buy in um oat milk we buy in but our life is is very simple incredibly simple we we pay a lot of attention to to working the land we work the land very very gently we don't use chemicals we don't use fertilizers um we use the bedding from the cows which is so we believe it to be pure and and that that nurtures the land i i really have no time for people who talk nitrates and over nitrates and pollution because if if one does things carefully there's no harm done it, it's when things become very big and machinery is doing all the work that that one gets problems with with over fertilization using cow bedding and cow dung we we don't have a lot of light here. We tend to be very, very wary of light pollution. We're not afraid of the dark, so we might use battery headlights, rechargeable batteries, of course, um, when we go out at night in the dark. Um, Matthew's great. He just potters off in the dark and <laughs> I have to have light. Um, but we we tend to read a lot. We We don't need many material things our clothes seem to last we finished growing so our clothes last forever um, i wash everything by hand we we tend to not follow fashion so we don't have to wear trendy clothing we we don't go out very much we tend not to eat food from outside because we believe that when one prepares food the energy that's that's in a person Will transfer to the food so if somebody's angry or unhappy we don't want to eat food that's being prepared by them so very rarely we'll go out and and have a cup of tea with someone or meet someone somewhere um, other than that we just eat three meals here um, we eat very very healthily we we tend to stay away from sweet processed foods or salty foods or ultra spicy foods we think that they're they're not particularly good for 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 us for the soul for for taking us away from a balanced a balanced day it's um very hard to adapt to i i will tell everybody that that for the first two years here i would sit on the steps and cry we we live in the tiniest of little shacks that's smaller than my drawing room when i had a house and I couldn't believe that I would have to suffer um, not having hot water on tap, having to to make do with with um, heating. I can't. What I found the most difficult was we have a wood burning fire because the the dead trees Matt will cut up only when they're dead, um, and he'll keep them for logs for winter to make heat, and the heat makes the water. So in summer, we tend to live with just lukewarm water. And and it took me a long time to adapt to that. Um, I can't put logs on a fire because I, I might sound neurotic, but I'm terrified of burning anyone whose home is in those logs. So I tend to, if Matthew's not here or he's out getting hay or whatever, I tend to put another sweater on or I put a cardigan on and I keep warm that way and let the fire go out. But um, 
we think about we think about everything we do not in a neurotic way we live quite joyful happy full lives we want for nothing there as i sit here now talking to you i can't think of anything that i want i tend to focus or both of us focus on things we need and invariably that's for the benefit of the animals to to make their lives more pleasurable or or nicer but but we have we have them we have nature we have the trees i wake up in the morning to bird song and the cockerels crowing i go to bed at night listening to owls hooting we hear nature everything is quiet it's silent and i i just think how could anyone want any more than that i i can't imagine wanting any more than we have excellent. so we Let's... we tend to respect everything mm -hmm. and we live simply excellent Wenda. um there's actually from the audience someone's asking who in your life is your inspiration and why hmm. i would think there was a, a prabhu called kurma rupa and he was a very intelligent devotee, uh, very, very well educated. He was a teacher for many, many years. And one day he, he fed a cow outside his house in Vrindavan. And I knew him well um, in passing. And, and then one year he'd started a, a wonderful group called Care for Cows, where he took the cows off the street in Vrindavan. And he was such a simple man, such a gentle, gentle, simple man who just cared for cows. And he left his body about four years ago. And all through his life, all the time I knew him when he was serving cows, and people were saying, oh, he's a saint, oh, he's wonderful, oh, he's this. And he would sit with me. And, and, and I, used, well, when I visited Vrindavan, I'd forgotten this bit. And, and every one of the religious people was heading to, to the temple for Mangalarti, and I was going the other way, <laughs> doing japa. And they would say, Mataji, why are you not going to take darshan? And I was saying, I am in the cow shed. And, and he would be there in the same way that I wanted to be there. And we would feed the orphan calves in the morning, and he would say to me, this is all I want. I'm no saint. I'm no wonderful person. I'm just blessed to serve the cows. And to me, he was the holiest of people because of his humility, because of his dedication to what he did. And, and I think what was most wonderful was he, he had stage four stomach cancer. And a lot of his supporters wanted to send him to the best hospital in Delhi, and he said no. He said, just give me the treatment that I have to have and then take me home to my cows. And he left his body surrounded. He got them to take him out on his bed into the, the Goshala. And he left his body surrounded by the cows who he loved and who loved him. <laughs> oh, oh, that's very touching. Yeah, very blessed soul. And, and to me, uh, humility is most important. Right, Wenda. Um, I know, I think, Wenda, you've got a couple of minutes uh, uh, remaining. Um, one key question is, um, Wenda, you know, you're doing such wonderful work. Um, how do you manage to run this farm? Like, do you get government grants? Do you, are you relying on benefit, you know, sort of donations? Or do you also raise finance from some of the products you raise from the farm? So how do you sort of run, run the yeah. farm? When we first started, um, now uh, we have 476 animals and birds here. So in the last few months, we've taken 100 more. But when we first started, we said that we would work as well as care for the animals. We would work the land. We would make things um, to sell that would fund the land. I, I do work in the evenings to fund Matthew and me. So it's really only our food, some petrol, um, 
uh, internet connection and things like that. So, so we are funded completely independently to the, the sanctuary. But as we've grown, um, we tend to attract people who want to support what we're doing. Uh, we do everything for the benefit of the animals. So, so when somebody wants to sponsor an animal, it's not a question of them saying, I want to sponsor that cow or I want to sponsor that sheep. We ask them to present themselves to be chosen so that, so that their relationship with whoever they've sponsored is a two-way thing. So it benefits them both. Um, we, we have hard and fast rules over how we will take Lakshmi from people. And it has to be moral. So sponsorship by 600 people of one animal who will never know any of them is not the way we want to go. So over the years, we've tailored everything so that it's fair for people. People who's, who donate to us regularly are invited once a year to come to a, a buffet and a day with other people who support the farm and other people who sponsor the animals as our way of saying thank you for supporting them. We like to give back so that everything is balanced. And, and we find people will say, oh, oh, you're never out. You're never asking for money all the time. But why would we? Because sanctuary has to be sanctuary so that, that we between us have to be able to give our residents the basics. If everything goes wrong in society, we have to feed them and we have to bed them. And between us, we can just about do that. Donations and regular donations um, and, and the sponsorships help us do more. It means when people donate that we can keep our gates open for other, pe other animals, we call them people, it's terrible, but other beings who want to come, who need to come to us. And, and, and it's a collective thing. We do the hard work. We believe in what we're doing. We, we love what we're doing. And people who are not in a position to do what we do have over the years said, look, let us contribute to you. Let us give something so you can do what you do so that the pressure is lifted a little in that you have to find X amount every week. And, and it's worked. It really has worked. But our, our whole thought, our whole thinking is that every one of the residents here is our responsibility we have taken them and if people support what we do that's fine but but we can't say we only survive on your donations that's emotional blackmail that is like asking people to fund a lifestyle and and none of us is forced to do this we do it out of choice so so when i hear somebody say Oh, they've got to fund us. They've got to support us. No, they don't have to. You can invite them to do so. And if they like what they see, then they probably will. But in the main, we, we fund the sanctuary as much as we can. Um, Matthew makes woodland products. Um, we we uh, do shows. I've just done a show a week ago um, selling things that, that I make from, from cotton fabric. We... We do all sorts of gentle things. We don't buy in plastic anything to sell out. Um, the The products that we sell are, we have friends in India who hand roll incense, which is vegan. Um, no, no hoof glue or anything in there. Um, we make soap. I make candles. Um, we make bags. We make lots of things from cotton. Um, I make cards, I take photographs, we make big prints, things that people will love, Christmas cards, calendars, and and it's it's just a gentle, nice, morally sound, um, environmentally sound way of, of funding ourselves. Excellent, Linda. Has COVID had any impact? Like, I know you have quite a few uh, summer shows and you have open days. Uh, mm -hmm. So have, have you had any impact due mm -hmm. to COVID? <laughs> well, um, COVID was nothing compared to the weather this summer. <laughs> it was, we had to cancel um, two open days because the rain was so bad that, that you couldn't even see in front of your face. 
So we had two open days, which were absolutely wonderful. People rolled over from one open day to another. Um, and, and we had a, a nice time. Uh, granted, we didn't fund as much as we, we wanted to because, because we were short of open days. And we couldn't have all the people from the previous two open days attend on the, the open days we were able to hold. But um, COVID was something to be reckoned with. But then again, everybody was in the same boat. It wasn't just us who felt the pinch. It wasn't just us that couldn't go to shows because they were all cancelled. Um, I think there's one more show this year. So, so this year, too, will be a challenge. But we rise to the challenge. We can't just sit and, and chew our nails to the quick and say, oh, this is so terrible. Oh, we can't cope. Put your head down and find a way of going on because we have 476 little souls who are all dependent on us and we have to find a way of doing things. Wonderful, Wenda. I, I think uh, we could just carry on and on, Wenda. You just, uh, so much inspiration, so much you do. Uh, uh, you know, it's just very, very admirable. I hope you're actually feeling better now. Uh, are you feeling better uh, with, the, with the long COVID? Oh, much. I, I haven't fallen over in a Sainsbury's supermarket for about four weeks now. <laughs> Excellent. No, and I, I wish you well. And, you know, may, may you be blessed with Thank all you. the strength because you're doing so much for, for yourself and for the others. So we really hope that, you know, may you and Matthew be blessed to just carry on uh, doing what you're doing. Hope Thank one day, uh, we, as, we, could, we as a school have got a lot of young children. So hopefully uh, when the time is right, mm -hmm. maybe we could do a, 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 a trip to, to your farm. I haven't actually been to your farm myself, but I'm really it looking forward to visiting lovely. you. We, we can always, we, we often, uh, the, the elderly Janes love it here right. and, and they will come by the coach load and, and they leave us with a, with a, a jump in their step. They come as, as very mature people and by the time they've seen the cows and, and said how much it reminds them of Gujarat, then they, they live again and it's wonderful to see. So, so yes, we can, we can arrange a day and bring the children and and they can have a taste of real life that's great Wendy. just a quick question someone uh janey from the audience is asking that she's been amazed on how much you do and she's wondering uh do you have any support from others to help run the sanctuary because it's just amazing just with both of you um you know how, how are you managing <laughs> we we when we started we took a few people who wanted to volunteer and within a year we'd found out that volunteering didn't work for us. It, it, it didn't run along our philosophy. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but we had some hair raising situations with people. Um, and, and we said then, maybe the best thing is we do what we can do. We, we have nothing else to do with our lives other than serve the residents. And the time will come. We're, we're not fooling ourselves that we're going to go on forever. It's it's going to be that our bodies will probably let us down and they will grow old, but our minds will stay young. And and we need to, by that time, have other people in place. So probably in the next 10 years, we are going to have to start accepting people, one or two people who can can learn how things are done here. And obviously, with new blood, there will be change and we have to accept that. Um, we need to be sure, though, that whoever comes here will have enough or glean enough knowledge from us so that no one, no one is euthanized, no one is killed, um, that, that they are willing to, to dedicate their lives to the animals. But, but no, we do everything on our own, everything. We, between us, we can do everything here. What Matthew can't do, I can do. What I can't do, he can do. And we can do amazing things together. So we have to impart that knowledge to younger people with younger bodies yeah. and and hope and pray yeah. or just trust, perhaps, that that life here will go on when we don't. And and that we have to embrace the change that new new blood brings. But I I hope that this place will go on years and years and years and years after we no longer go on. 
That's wonderful, Wenda. Um, I think I'll now pass it on. To, thank you very much. I really sincerely do thank you for all the time you've taken, Wenda. Pleasure. You are a truly inspirational person. I and, and a, a real, I think, to the whole gene community, they must be absolutely amazed to see what kind of work you're doing. And as they say, you know, you 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 are a Jane by the actions, and uh, we wish you well, and uh, hope you know you you're able to look after yourselves and, and look after the animals, uh, you know, 476 animals. So all the very best to you, Wenda. Thank you. From it. Um... Thank you, Rajiv, and thank you very much, uh, Winda. Uh, that um, conversation was spellbinding. We were, I think I was glued to every word that you were saying. Truly, truly inspirational. Uh, it's amazing to, to find somebody who's living those values every single day and, and thinking about the the minutest details about your your existence. Um, I think on behalf of all the audience and on behalf of Viratan, uh, thank you very much for your time today, sharing your life experiences. And uh, we really look forward to hoping uh, to be able to come and see you on your sanctuary and to visit those wonderful uh, cows that you've mentioned to us. And I know you've got some special piglets as well that you really like. So we're, we're yes. looking forward to seeing all of those. <laughs> They'll be here. The we, have a, we have a couple more coming. <laughs> yes. So we, we look forward to that. Um, Rajiv, thank you very much as well for conducting this conversation. Uh, I think you're always. most welcome. I think one more thing. I think at the end of this conversation, if people would like to support Huglet's Farm, uh, you yes. can probably share the details. Yes, so I was just coming on to that. So, okay, so we've got the details here. Um, we will post on the chat um, some details. If anybody would like to uh, support Wenda and the farm and the animals there, uh, you can do those in those different ways by going on the GoFundMe page or through PayPal or with direct bank transfers. Um, if you can't get the details, uh, please get in touch with us and we will happily share those details with you um so thank you thank you thank you very much and and also please pass on our regards and thanks to matthew he seems to have done an amazing job Will with do. you alongside you all right my so soulmate <laughs> yes <laughs> and when when we go back to face to face when uh, you're more, more than welcome to come and see us in our school so please do come and oh, see thank us thank you We'd love to. That would be lovely. Us. So when Thank we you. do that, when we're back to base space, we'll definitely let you know. Of course. Okay, so Thank you. to close this uh, session today, I'd like to ask Mihir, who's going to do our final final play, prayer today with the Manglik. Mihir, over to you. Chattari Mangalam, Arihanta Mangalam, Sita Mangalam, Sahu Mangalam, Kevali Panato Damo Mangalam, Chattari Logutama, Arihanta Logutama, Sita Logutama, Sahu Logutama, Kevali Panato Damo Logutama, Chattari Sharnam Pavajami, Arihante Sharnam Pavajami, Sitte Sharnam Pavajami, Sahu Sharnam Pavajami, Kavali Panatam Damam Sharnam Pavajami. Thank you very much, Mihir. And just a final thing now. So today was our first uh, in conversation with. Uh, with Wenda, and next week uh, we've got a Jerishri Jannaji Maharaj joining us for a very special conversation with her. So again, a truly, truly inspirational person. Uh, I know many of you have met her when she's come over here to London, and some of you will have seen her and met her in India. So she does some amazing work, and she will be our special guest next week at the same time at 8.15. So please uh, join us then and please pass on the message to your friends and family. Thank you very much. 
Jay Janendra, and have a lovely week.